Introducing the new Crosspoint Church app. Our new app helps you stay connected to Crosspoint, whether it's through watching sermons or reading the built-in Bible. You can take Crosspoint with you wherever you go. Download the free Crosspoint app for iOS and Android devices today. We hope that Crosspoint is making an impact on your life. If you would like to partner with us financially, visit crosspoint.church and choose the giving option that works best for you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Now today I want to talk to you, obviously, about anger. And since I'm preaching about anger, I try to do this about once a year. And since I'm preaching about anger, and I knew I was talking about anger, the devil has tried all week long to make me angry. Does that ever happen to anybody? You know, you're trying to do better on something and focus on something. And, and every little thing that possibly can happen happens and goes wrong, and it just is really a challenge. So everyone in this room has experienced anger on some kind of a level. Destructive, debilitating anger. I've referenced this in this series already, but I'd like to give you a little flashback. We talked about dating, and you know how that when you're dating, everybody's on their best behavior, right? Everything is lovely. You know what triggers anger in a relationship? Wedding cake. Amen. In a marriage, anger and tempers quickly surface. Where, Where was that at, we ask? I mean, what in the world happened... Where was that hiding? Where did that come from? Jesus says it was in his heart the whole time. It's just a matter of time before you get a glimpse of it, right? He said what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. So, you know, you you do real well. It's amazing to me how I can hear these stories, but people will say, you know, I get along with everybody. It works so well, and everything seems to be going so fine. We deal with some tough issues. We work through some stuff without blowing up. But just as soon as I walk through the door back home, Every little thing really sets me off. You're always on edge around the people that you love the most. Why in the world is that? Today we're going to talk about getting rid of it. And because everyone in this room has on some level struggled in the arena of anger, you need to really pay attention. So go ahead and nudge the person sitting next to you and tell them, listen up, this is for you. Amen. Now Paul is writing from prison and he tells us, that there's a way to get rid of anger and you don't have to carry it with you through life in every season of your life. He said there's a way to do this the right way. And he says that anger isn't all about the circumstances as you may think. He teaches us that anger is an issue of the heart. At the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. You, You can get rid of your anger. Now, you may say, Pastor... This sermon really isn't for me. I'd be willing to bet you that the people that are closest to you would say, oh, yes, it is. This sermon is for you. And uh, they're sitting there thinking, oh, boy, I I sure hope so-and-so is listening to this one. They need it today. Let's look at the Scripture. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry, be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Still angry. Now, those words coming from the original text virtually mean carrying anger around with you. Still angry, you're still carrying it with you. In other words, you got angry over one thing, but here we are two weeks later, two months later, two years later. You're still angry. You're still carrying it with you everywhere you go. Now, this was a popular saying. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. This was a popular saying in their culture, kind of like, Ours is a bird in the hand. You know, all those sayings that we have. He was saying that that they should pay attention to what your mom and dad have taught you because this is good advice. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now, my daddy drilled this into me. And when Sylvia and I first got married, her parents hadn't drilled this into her. And so we struggled early on because we would have an argument about something And five minutes later, I was ready to kiss and make up. But no, that wasn't how she was wired. And it would go on sometimes, you know, and I'd try to make up for it. And and, and this could go on for days. And I'm like, we got to do something about this. And so I broke my Bible out. Let me tell you, folks, don't start quoting this scripture to your spouse in the middle of a fight. It's only going to escalate things and make it a whole lot worse. So just learn from PT because that's not the way to do it. Amen. They don't like to have Scripture quoted to them in the middle of an argument. I'm not trying to contradict Scripture, 
But I think we all know that there are some anger issues that you simply cannot resolve within a 24-hour time frame. And so we're going to break this down and see what the, the writer was actually saying and what he was really talking about. Because I truly believe that Paul is actually speaking of a commitment to resolve anger. Even if you don't get it done before you close your eyes, you have an understanding that we're going to fix this. It may take us a while, but we're not going to walk away from it. We're not going to give up on it. We're going to hang in there until we resolve this problem. And for most guys, it's something that can probably be fixed in five to ten minutes. For most girls, it's going to take a little while longer because they process that stuff a little bit different, a little bit more uniquely than what the fellas do. So we've got an understanding that whatever it takes, we're going to hang in there until this is fixed. Now, the force of this is very clear. Get rid of your anger as soon as possible. Now, watch as Paul dips into this, his theology in verse 27. He discloses the reason, and he comes on real strong with this, that it's so important that you resolve your anger ASAP. He's wanting it dealt with. He goes on in Ephesians 4, 27, and do not give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. Don't give the devil a foothold. Now, the little Greek word here that's translated devil actually means the accuser. The accuser. So listen, I don't know if you believe there's a real devil or not. Most Americans believe in God, but a very small percentage of those same people actually believe in a real devil. I believe in the devil because Jesus did, and that's good enough for me. I mean, that's enough. But, but you don't have to believe in the devil to understand this principle. So, so listen carefully because this is so important. He says, when you uh, not get angry, but when you carry anger from one season of your life into the next, when you just hold on to it and you're still angry two weeks from today just like you are today, he said, you open up a door to the devil and you give the devil an opportunity or a foothold in your life. It's like opening the door to your heart and saying to the devil, come on in. Come on in. Make yourself at home. Find a seat anywhere. Listen, as long as you carry anger, the, the door is wide open for the devil to influence you and to impact your heart any way that he sees fit. When you choose to carry anger, you are giving the devil an opportunity. If you're still with me, say amen. You're giving the devil an opportunity. Now, you may not believe there's a devil... But here's what we all know, everybody in this room. You know that people who carry anger, whether it's you or somebody else, their lives have a tendency to absolutely wreak havoc wherever they go because free-flowing anger is detrimental to all relationships. That's good preaching. And it's true, too, right? You know this. Well, the Bible's explanation is the person who carries anger opens the door for the devil and allows him to come on in and make himself at home in your heart. Now, another way to understand this is to go back to something I said to you last Sunday. Remember when I told you uh, that guilt can be understood within the context of a debt or debtor relationship? We talked about that. Well, with anger, we have the best example of that. Last week we said guilt says, guilt's message, guilt's declaration is, I owe you. And I'm going to feel bad about it until I, you know, until I pay you back. Guilt says I owe you. Anger says you owe me. You owe me. The angry person lives with a system that's ingrained in their thinking, and it says you owe me here. This is a debt that you need to pay. And here's why this is so important. Because whenever you're, you're hurt, whenever you're offended, whenever you're mistreated, there's a sense that the person who offended you or mistreated you actually took something from you. They took something from you. If somebody stole your idea at work and they took credit from you or, or for it, they, they took something from you. If you grew up in a home where mom or dad took off and, and they left a piece of, you know, uh, they just walked away from the house and... and you, you know, didn't take their responsibilities anymore. They took something from you. You feel like they owe you. If you've been through a real difficult divorce and you feel like it was about 80% the other person's fault, then, then you likely have a sense that they took your first marriage away from you. They stole it. They robbed you of the opportunity to finish with the person that you started with, which is what you wanted. This is real important. Every time, 
every single time that you are hurt in a relationship, there's a sense that something has been taken away from you and anger just screams out, you owe me. You owe me and you're always going to owe me. And anger is, is like a bookkeeper, man. I'm not going to close this account until you pay me what you owe me. And as long as that account is open, you're going to be carrying that anger around with you everywhere you go. Now listen, the worst thing that you and I can do to ourselves is to allow the sun to go down, not on a day of your anger or a moment of your anger, but on a season of your life. On a season of your life and to carry the anger that was created in one season of my life into the next season of my life. Whenever you carry anger with you from one season of your life into a new season of your life, you run the risk of self-destruction. I get so worried about people who they have a, a bad relationship and a marriage ends and he was abusive or she run around or whatever the reason was. And they separate. And you know, in North Carolina, you've got to wait a year before you can have a, a divorce. And, and I get so worried about people who never go to counseling, who never talk to a pastor or a professional counselor. And all of a sudden... Two months after they moved out, somebody else has moved in. And I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you? You've not dealt with any of your issues, and you're going to take all this junk into your next relationship. You need that year that North Carolina requires, folks. You need that year to just cool off so you don't take this into the next season of your life. People don't like that kind of preaching, but I'm good at it anyway. Amen. You need to chill on some of this stuff and slow this train down because you're, you're blaming 80% of it on him or on her. And next thing you know, you got, you know, you got Billy Bob in the house with you and three months the news wore off and you're doing the same thing with him that you did with the one before him. There's a problem there. You're not, you're carrying your anger from one season of your life into the next season of your life. And when you do that, there's going to be a problem. Here's why. Because when the sun sets on a season of your life, that is your moving from one season to the next and, and you've not resolved your anger issues. Once you move to the next season, it's very easy to lose sight of the original source that caused you all that pain. Man, I've got counselors in this church and they're not in this service to give me some support. But I'm telling you the truth. It's very easy to lose sight of the source of your original hurt. All of a sudden, you're in a new season of your life and people around you just make you mad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. And the next thing you know, everybody around you is walking on eggshells whenever they get close to you because they've already been warned. And before you know it, nobody wants to get close to you anymore. Nobody wants to deal with it. It becomes a major problem. Listen to me. When you carry anger from one season of your life into the next... It's so easy to lose sight of the original source of why you are angry in the first place. Now you're angry at the people close to you in this new season of life, and they can't figure out what the heck they did to make you mad. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. That's, just, that's not just a 24-hour window. Don't let a season of your life come to an end without resolving your anger. I see this in broken marriages all the time. Now, let me... Let me Somebody say one of those amens that I like. Thank you. <laughs> I believe, let me just give you some plain talk here today. I believe that God intends for marriage to be for life. Anybody else still believe that old ideology and that old theology? But over the last 32 years of my ministry, I've had some couples to walk out of my office and they just didn't make it. Despite our very best efforts to try to help them hold it together, they just didn't make it. And I knew not only did their marriage not survive, their rage and their anger, you know, they, they weren't able to get past that. The next season of their lives wasn't going to survive it either because they let the sun set on it. Now, let me talk to those of you who are not married in the room and give those who are a little bit of a break, okay? So you listen very carefully, especially if you are engaged or dating an angry person. Mm -hmm. I don't care how hot she is. I don't care how rich he is 
or who his mama is or who her daddy is. You need to run like the wind. Run. Run like the wind. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you something, and you need to understand this, and this is absolutely vital. If you're dating somebody that has already put their cards on the table in the day and in time in which it's supposed to be the best it's ever going to be, those courtship days, right? And if they've already put all their cards on the table and they're angry or quick-tempered and they can't even stay sweet while you're courting, don't tell me how much you love them. Just run like the wind. Simple theology there, right? Otherwise, you're going to live a miserable life, folks. And that person's going to be angry at you all the time for something that you don't even understand. You're going to be more miserable than you can ever imagine. Somebody look at the person next to you on both sides and say, run like the wind. You better run from them angry people. Don't you get tied down to somebody that's got rage issues. No matter how hard you try or how many times you apologize, you will never see that person uh, put their anger to rest. You can't help them fix their rage because your name is not on that account. Hey, hey, Tracy, you're doing some good preaching, and they're not getting it. Are you getting it? Somebody else's name is on that account. His mama, her daddy, his ex, her ex, whoever it is, It ain't you. Run like the wind. Now, if our Heavenly Father loves us the way the Scriptures teach us, these next verses should come as no surprise to you guys. These verses seem a bit insensitive, but guess what? This isn't just about you. It's about the people that are around you, the people that you say you love the most. Okay? So here's what Paul from prison writes to us about this issue. Ephesians 4.31 Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. He says, just get rid of it. Listen, you know how, listen to me now, this is important. You know how you take your garbage and you set it out on the curb, right? Or you push it out to the road for garbage pickup. You you put it out of your house. And when you walk away from the can on the curb, you don't go back into your house thinking about what you threw out anymore. You're not going, did I, did I lick all that Reese cup out of that wrapper? Did I, did I clean that up real good? Did I, did I throw something away I shouldn't have? No, when you walk away from the curb, you know what you do? You forget about the garbage. You don't recycle that over and over in your mind. You know, it stunk. Maybe you let it sit in the garage a little too long. You finally got it out to the curb, and you're just glad to get rid of it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're just glad to get, out, get it out of there and have it thrown away. And somebody would say, but Paul, it's just not that simple. Paul says, yes, it is. Once you put it out, you need to get rid of it. You need to throw it away. You need to push away from it. When, when Ronnie Luck, who is not here, he's usually in this service. When Ronnie Luck was diagnosed with lymphoma cancer a number of years ago, I remember him telling me this. And this was, it stuck with me. This was uh, about 2003, 2004, uh, somewhere way back there. I remember him telling me this. He, He said, you know, when the doctors come in and said, you have lymphoma cancer, very aggressive type of cancer. I asked him, I said, how'd you respond? He said, well, he said, what I didn't say was, he said, my first question wasn't, well, doc, how did I get this? I said, well, that makes sense. What would you ask? He said, my first question was, how do we get rid of it? What are we going to do? Let's strap it on. Let's get it done. He just was ready. What's it going to take? What's got to happen? You tell me what to do because I'm a fighter and I'm not about to just ride this out and barely get by. You tell me what to do to get rid of this and we're going to get rid of it. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to issues of the heart, we spend so much time defending it because of how we got it. Instead of buckling up and saying, you know what? I don't want to live with this another day. This is killing me. If there's a way to get rid of it, let's do it. Let's strap it on. I'm ready. I don't care who's to blame. I just want this out of my system. That's what we ought to be thinking, amen? But we get hung up on whose fault it is, and we live with that, and we care from one season to another. I ain't mad. I'm just, it sounds like it sometimes. I'm just trying to be emphatic so you get this, okay? 
You know, it's, it's so difficult for so many of us. And, and, and here's why. Because if we just march it out to the curb and we leave it in the garbage can and try not to think about it anymore, you know why we struggle with that? Watch me now. Here's why we struggle with that. Because we feel like we're letting them off the hook. If I just let them off the hook, that's not fair. Besides, they owe me. They owe me. Listen to me right now. Getting rid of anger bypasses the issue of fairness, and it bypasses the issue of being paid back. Suddenly you realize that stuff is not the supreme value anymore. Getting rid of it is more valuable and more important than getting paid back. Paul understands this principle, so listen to what he says in Ephesians 4.32. He said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving. I knew that was coming, preacher. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. I knew it. I knew that's where you was going, and it was going to come down to forgiveness. But can I at least tell my story first? I need you to listen to my story. No. No, you can't. But I was a victim. Yeah, I know. We've all been victims at some point. But how many seasons of your life are you going to carry that into? How many seasons are you going to carry that into? Guess what else? The source of your hurt all of these years later has kind of gotten lost. And now, even though that started and originated many years ago, now you don't even realize it, and you're blaming people who didn't hurt you for your anger. How long are you going to keep doing that? How long are you going to keep carrying that with you to season after season? Forgiveness is is such a simple thing on paper, okay? I get it. I understand what some of you are thinking. It's a simple thing to stand up here and preach. In fact, it goes back to the the debt-debtor thing. Do you know what it means to forgive? It simply means to cancel a debt. It simply means to cancel a debt. You decide, okay, according to the records, you owe me. I'm canceling that debt so you don't owe me anymore. Not because you paid me back. Not because you made it right. I'm deciding right now, debt canceled. You don't owe me anymore. Forgiveness closes the door To the accuser, forgiveness breaks the power of anger. It is the only thing that will. It's the only thing that does. Hey, listen, in my business, I've heard all the horror stories. I've heard all of them. I've sat with the families who've who've told me stuff, and I wanted to, look, I I keep telling you guys, I'm not a great counselor. We've got great counselors in our church. I, I get so emotionally connected to your story. Somebody will tell me a story, and, you know, I have some... Sweet young girl come in and some idiot has beat her up and she's got a black eye and, and she's sitting there and she's telling me with tears streaming down her face and, and I'm going, you know, I know people. We, we can, I can make a phone call. We can, we can take care of this. Steenhatchee River, Steenhatchee, Florida. We sent them down there. The gators will have them. It'll be done. You know, that's kind of emotionally where I'm at on some of these heart-wrenching stories. And I'm like, wow. And I keep telling y'all I'm not a good counselor, but you keep coming. What is wrong with you people? It's just the way that I'm wired. And and, uh, when I get to a certain point, I always tell people, you know what? Uh, I think that we need to get you a professional Christian counselor because I'm not much up on uh, secular counseling, but I love those Christian counselors that can really uh, express their calling and help you and take you to the next level. And I think that's really good, but, but it's so important when you hear those stories, those gut-wrenching stories, ultimately, we come to the realization that keeping the books open on our anger does nothing to help us move on with our lives in a positive way. It's not helping you. It, it only opens the door to the accuser who comes in and destroys, and he'll do this because he's good at it. He comes in to destroy everything that you hold dear. And I know what you're thinking, but Pastor... Before I do that, if you would just listen to my story. Paul knew you would say that. So look again at how he closed this for us. So important. Hang in there with me. We're almost done. Look at how he he closes this for us, and he he just really drives this home. The last part of verse 32 again says, Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. 
Pastor, I may be at fault just a little bit, maybe 10%, but 90% of this is her fault. 90% of this is his fault. Guess what? When God sent Jesus to forgive you for your sin, Jesus wasn't guilty of anything. He hadn't done anything anything wrong. He wasn't to blame for anything. He was blameless, the Bible says, and he lived a blameless life. He carried no guilt with him. God said, okay, you're not going to be able to pay me what you owe me. That's a given. You're just not going to be able to do it, so I'm going to send my son Jesus to the cross, and on the cross, he's going to cancel your debt, and when you acknowledge what he's done for you on the cross, the case is going to be closed. We're going to close the book on that, on that part of your life. We're going to take the garbage to the curb, and we're going to leave it there, and we're going to go back and live a better life. Your debt has been paid in full, period. Amen? What was your story again? <laughs> well, when you, when you put it like that, preacher, I, I guess I don't really have a story. That's right, you don't. If God can close the books and cancel your debt, for everything that you've ever done wrong in your life, you better find a way to do the same thing. You've got to find a way to do the same thing. Just get rid of it. Take it out to the curb. Take the garbage out to the curb and leave it there. Now, don't ever forget this. Forgiveness breaks the power of anger. Three things. Let's give a, a quick application and we're done. We'll have a good prayer together this morning. Three things to help you apply this. And I can't see the clock that's on the back wall, so as far as I know, I'm cool. (laughs) Three things to help you apply this. First of all, you need to identify who you're angry with. Listen to me here, okay? Because some of of our vision on this one is very short, you know, it's very short-sighted. Listen, you you have to be really careful with this one because you're going to be tempted to name people who are in your immediate vicinity right now. Don't do that, guys. Don't just automatically assume that it's their fault. It's him. It's, it's her. It's her. You know, don't do that. But, but here's my challenge for you today. This is good, great application, and you need to write it down. Would you be willing to go back a couple of seasons into your past and ask that same question? Just sit down, find you a quiet place, and go back in your mind to a previous relationship, a previous encounter, and ask that same question. Who am I angry with? Where did this originate? Ask that question. Remember, when you move your anger from from season to season, it's easy to lose sight of the true source of that anger and that rage. You need to spend some time figuring out who you're really angry with. Just do it. Because I'm I'm gathering this. I mean, I'm just kind of deducting this from who we are, you're really not mad because he didn't put the toilet seat back down. It's not him that you're that, I mean, you just went nuts. And you're really not that angry because she didn't put the cap back on the toothpaste. There's a deeper source here and there's a deeper problem. And you're going, I don't understand. All these little things just set me off. You've got an issue that you need to go back and you need to deal with. And you need to, first of all, identify who you're angry with. Number two, You need to decide what was taken from you. You need to decide what was taken from you. In other words, what specifically do you feel that they owe you? What do you feel they owe you? You see, you can't cancel a debt until you figure out what's owed to you, right? What did they take from you? Spend some time on that. It it may be painful for you to face what was taken, but before you can cancel a debt, you've got to know what that that was. You, You make a list. And you be specific about it, okay? And then here's the big one. Here's the big one that kind of flushes this out of your system. Cancel the debt. Once you identify the debt, cancel the debt. You have to decide. You have to make a conscious, conscious decision to cancel the debt. And here's something, and this is a part of my application on this sermon every year. And I try to really push this home. You need to make a big deal out of it. Sometimes the bigger the deal, the more powerful the forgiveness that you're able to provide. Write it down. Good, good advice here. Write it down, seal it in an envelope, and burn it outside. Just burn it. Dig a hole in your backyard, put it in the hole. Cover it up, and if you really want to do it right, after you bury that hurt that's been going with you from season to season to season of your life, after you dig a hole and you put that envelope in it and you bury it, 
put a cross on top of that hole. So that every time you look out there, you don't remember the thing that you buried. You see the cross and you go, wow, look what Jesus did for me. He forgave me. He canceled my debt. And who am I to hold this over anybody else? Amen. Refuse to go into the next season of your life carrying all that rage with you. Have a ceremony. Make a big deal out of it. Extend forgiveness to the people that have hurt you the most. So as I've done every week in this series, I want to ask you some questions before we close together. Is everything okay in your heart? Is everything okay in your heart? Are you mad at anybody? Do you find yourself going off on people around you for no apparent reason? What's going on in your heart? Don't don't you think that You need to do whatever it takes to guard your heart and to get this stuff out there on the table. How long are you going to carry this around with you? How long? Go ahead and define a time. Just just figure it out. I think I'm going to hold on to this for another year, another six months, another two years. Go ahead and define a time. A year, two years, how long? Why are you doing that? Cancel the debt. Do it now because forgiveness breaks the power of anger in your heart. What are you waiting for? This not only sets the person that owes you free, this sets you free. It it releases you, the Scripture said, from the tormentors once that you provide forgiveness. You say, well, preacher, they ain't going to ask. Who cares? This ain't for them. This is for you. Bury it. Put a cross on it. And stand on the promise of Jesus. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I... I love this church, and I love this congregation of people. And I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that you'll speak life into our hearts. Here's what I know. I've I've heard a lot of stories over the last 32 years as a pastor. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain that are sitting in these chairs today. There's a lot of people that have lived through some unimaginable circumstances and events that have shattered their world. There's people that are watching us online today and watching us on our website that they've endured some horrific things in their past. And God, they're angry. And the pain is, is so great. And they're, they're just thinking that I can't let this go because they owe me. They've got to settle this debt and I'm going to hold on to it until they come back to make it right. Father God, would you please help us? I know that there's... About 60% of the people in this room have been Christ followers for about five or six years or less, just since that we moved on to this campus. About 60% of the people in this room are relatively still very new to the faith. And maybe they're hearing this principle of forgiveness and canceling debts and dealing with anger for the very first time. But, oh God, how liberating it is, how powerful it is when we cancel a debt And we follow a biblical principle to say, I'm not going to hold this over their head anymore. If they never ask for for my forgiveness, if they never make a move toward reconciliation with me, I refuse to carry this seed of anger from season to season to season of my life. I'm going to cancel that debt. And when I start over this time, I'm not taking it with me. I'm not moving it into my new house. I'm not taking it into my new relationship. I'm letting it go. And I'm going to love Jesus and love the people that are here with me now. I'm just going to love Jesus and love people. Help us, God, to do that today in Jesus' name because anger is like a chain that has weighed us so heavy down. It's like a chain that the devil wraps around our neck and around our arms and legs and then he tosses us into the ocean and we fight for survival. And all we got to do to break those chains, all we have to do is experience forgiveness and grant forgiveness. Cancel the debt. Father, break some chains in this room today, and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name.